All right, here we go. 5 p.m. PST um, out in California, the United States of America. Sarah here, one of the co-founders of She Talks Asia, and I am going to see how this goes. Hi, Michael, I see you joined. Um, Renee is in the building. We're gonna get started here real quick. I am going to figure out how to have you Join. Michael, could you actually request to join um, the chat and I can pull you right on up? I should have probably, oh, here we go, Michael. I should have probably um, did a run through too. Michael and Jelly did a run through yesterday. Bada bing, bada bing. Um, yeah, so I'm super stoked for the talk today. Uh, for anybody that um, didn't sort of uh, see the the explanation about what trauma was yesterday or the poster for what we're doing today, what we're gonna be discussing is healing as a form of self-love. Um, and ah, there he is, hi. Hi, how are you? How are you? Okay, so you're coming through straight on the phone and I'm, I'm gonna put those away. How are you, Michael? Great to be here and nice to see you. How are nice you doing today? Talking. Yeah, so I was actually thinking that I could um, start by giving a little bit of context on how we came together in the first place and what we're gonna be doing today. Um, so as, as one of the co-founders of, of She Talks Asia, one of the intentions that we set really when we started five years ago, we're celebrating our fifth anniversary this year, um, was to be able to empower uh, the communities that we had access to um, and giving them um, access to uh, tools, uh, speakers, stories, um, and just uh, exposure in any which way or form uh, that may sort of widen their perspectives or their toolkits uh, for for a journey of of empowerment one, um, which then turned into two, really a, a journey of healing in in many regards, um, in many different ways, shapes, and forms. Um, and while it has been five years in the making, we still feel like we're just scratching the surface on on what it is that we have the capacity to do. And I was really overjoyed um, when the team sort of reached out with this proposal to, to do this series of talks um, and for you and I to get together and speak because when I saw that you uh, have dedicated four years of your life to studying um, the polyvagal theory, which I thought was some sort of like, you know, very, very niche kind of thing that I would never find anybody to talk to about. For sure, I've definitely tried to to share a little bit here on the She Talks Asia platform. Um, I did a little video with like my daughter's toys a couple of years ago, talking about the survival responses. Um, but I will say that when our tribe pulled together and Jelly, who was one of our tribe members, um, came forth and said, uh, Michael Westgate, I think is, is gonna be a great resource. And um, for all the gamuts of reasons, um, I now understand why she has presented you um, as one of the people to explain the subject matter to us because it can get a little crazy, it can get a little heady, it can it get can. a little, it can get a little. I mean, we can go into many different ter territories from deep feelings to scientific, sort of like the scientific, the big science words. Yeah. Um, and I'm going to stop talking soon, I promise. But I just really <laughs> wanted. <laughs> I really wanted to. I really just wanted to lay all of that out there. Um, and say that with all of that, the intention today is to simplify everything as much as possible, um, right. to, to find the correct words and hope that they find uh, the people that need to hear the most. Um, and on that note, Michael Westgate, tell us a little bit about your story and your journey and how you landed in, in, on our screen today. Great, I, I'd love to. Um, my story was a, a very, quite a long journey of of, of a lot of suffering from trauma and and i won't go into graphic detail of course but you know i i had a very difficult childhood and it set me up for having a long list of challenges so you know my my the short list is depression anxiety chronic pain insomnia autoimmune disease and a lot of challenges with relationships and that's a typical list if you have trauma in your life um and what happened was that, you know, I'm one of these people that for some, I was blessed somehow with a lot of determination and a lot of willpower. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna get well somehow. I didn't even know what was wrong with me exactly, but I knew that something was off. So I spent 33 years um, 
practicing, searching, <clears throat> going to doctors and other practitioners, and trying to find answers. And what I found was very little helped. And this was really frustrating because I wasn't, you know, I wasn't screwing off, right? I'm, I was a diligent, honest, good person, trying my best to get through life and be the best person I could be. And I kept suffering anyway. And it was one of those things. It's like, you do what you're told and that doesn't work. And you're like, what happened here? Like, how is that possible? All these experts, you know, quote, are telling me what to do. I'm doing what I'm told and it's not working. And we also, um, I know that in the United States, especially, and that may be true around the world, trauma is, is poorly understood. I mean, that's an understatement and, and it's better now, but it, it, before it was awful. And usually people are blamed. The traumatized people tend to be blamed for being difficult and so on. So it's a, it's a, it's a lonely journey too, often. Now I'm not saying nothing helped, but I'm saying nothing helped long term and nothing really got to the root. And then four years ago, I read a book called The Body Keeps a Score, which was written by Dr. Vanderkirk, who's considered one of the world experts in trauma. And sorry, I'm gonna get choked up here. I just was so overwhelmed because he explained my whole life. He just laid it out. And he, but what he did is he said, my research is based largely on the model of polyvagal theory. So I followed his advice and I actually got well finally. It took about a year. It's still, I mean, still working on it, but this huge shift in a year doing polyvagal informed therapies and self practice. And I was so excited by the results and overwhelmed by the results, even in a sense that I put, I just decided I'm going to know why this works. I'm going to make sure I know every possible detail about why this works because I'm going to help other people do this too. Uh, which I have been doing in my practice ever since and have had unbelievable results with certain people and not everybody, obviously, because you can't, you never know, by the way, why you can't help certain people. It's, it's too complicated to know, but I've had spectacular results with my clients and my own life and my family. Um, and so it's just proven to me over and over again that polyvagal is a, is a real gift to us, all of us really seeking answers um to our struggles so that's that was the journey thank you and that's so much, michael yeah thank you so yeah. much for, for sharing that and i i do want to i do want to take this time to kind of lay out that um polyvagal theory uh which we i will get michael to explain because he's definitely much more versed um this is something it's it's basically a, a framework a re Michael, stop me if I'm if I'm sort of meandering off in the wrong direction, but it is a uh, a shifted framework from um, a departure from the traditional view of how doctors uh, understand how your body and brain work. Is that correct? Uh, uh, it's yeah. Let's just think of, to simplify it. It's the we had a model of our nervous system that explains stress response before this, before polyvagal. And, and as Dr. Porges explains, it wasn't incorrect, it was incomplete. So it was only part of the view. And unfortunately, that p only partial view led to a lot of misunderstanding about how we respond and digest stress, right? And, and Porges upgrade, what happened is once he upgraded the view and he presented it to the people that, that worked with people struggling with trauma, for example, and chronic pain, is they just went wild. Because they're like, oh my God, this is what, it's like an incomplete map. So imagine you had a treasure map that didn't have everything you needed to find the X spot, right? And, and, but you thought it did, but it didn't work. So you kept digging, you didn't find anything. So what polyvagal is, is it's the treasure map that shows you how to get back to safety. And what, what Porges explains is that what they didn't understand before is that we have a newer branch of our nervous system of the vagus system that is specifically designed uh, to help us connect safely with other people. And the thing that's so incredible about that is that it's not just that you feel safe. It, when you feel safe, you're able to do things you can't do when you don't feel safe. And that's why if you're traumatized and you're wondering, why can't I focus? Why can't I sleep? Why can't I get along with other people? It's because your social system, which that, that new branch is not working. And therefore you, it's not just, you don't feel safe. It's that you don't feel 
say uh, that that's connected it's wired in with all kinds of other amazing things like creativity and deep learning healing states rest and so on does that make i hope i said that clearly it does absolutely and and i think we've done what um we suspected we do and we've gone like straight into the into the belly of of polyvagal theory i do want to take a moment to to kind of reel it back and for for those sure. uh for the folks that are watching i think what we're really trying to get that get at michael and i were kind of tossing around some like from analogies the sort of through lines and concepts um and i think that what we're talking about today is is a a, a fairly new branch of study um yes, very new very new branch of study that is proposing in, in so many ways why things like your self-care routine actually work like what it's actually doing on a scientific level inside your body um exactly. and i think it's really fascinating because what what uh the research is now finding out is um well and michael can explain this much better is that you know our brain is is extremely old uh and i think that you know as the brain has adapted it it goes through certain stages with which michael can um, pro, uh, expound on in a little bit um but it's like sometimes we find ourselves in situations uh where we are instantly sort of um brought back or triggered or or brought back to a scenario in which our really really old outdated brain is the one that takes charge and you respond as you know a, a, a yeah you respond <laughs> as, as a lizard instead of a human being as a lizard and so so okay, or, so right evolution evolutionarily if that is even a word we our brains we separated from like reptilians and lizards at a certain That's point right. of time and then from there we went to become primates which meant that we could be aggressive or defensive instead of because because the li, all the lizard knows how to do is shut down which is basically what depression is right yeah so we have right. like this thing but they get right so like geckos lizards in the philippines and really when a sound you know you make a loud sound they really just they just stop right they yeah, just, like, there's no up. there's no sort of like emotional response there's no like strategic sort of like thinking what should i do it just there's no it's manipulation just, there's no you know, kind of cajoling it's just if I feel threatened, I'll act like I'm dead. Period. So that was, yeah. that, that's the that's the ancient circuit, the most so ancient that's circuit. The third, the, the the one all the way back there. Okay, and then yeah. got one more stop before where we are now, and and that is what that's the that's um, the sympathetic system where okay. where they call the limbic brain, and that was developed when we became primates, or as we became primates, mammals generally. And um, then after hundreds of millions of years, we developed what's called as the social system, which is the and the way that developed is that the primates that were most cooperative did better, you know, reproduced more often, didn't die as fast. So that the wiring became that if you are successfully bonded to other people, uh, you know, other critters, you know, that we were, then you will, then it turns on health, healing, creativity, and all that. It's all wired in. And therefore, um, our resilience to stress and trauma is primarily based on how well bonded we are with other human beings Incredible. and if we can and, and we have to bond first with another person before we can feel safe on our own and right so therefore if for example like if uh, those of you that like me had a mother who was depressed um that means you don't get proper bonding it's called co-regulation in, in polyvagal terms and you have to have that to have access to all these other gifts that humans can access now if your mother can't do it that doesn't mean you know you're doomed it means that you still need to be connected safely with another human being now it could have been your coach at school it could have been a therapist uh, it could be your best friend it, it, it has to be somebody right and um and ongoing in life it's not like you just need it once and you're done yeah you have to continue to repeat that rhythm and what it is it's a reciprocal synchronous rhythm so what really turns on the social system is to get into a safe reciprocal rhythm with another person and that's what builds the sense of trust and safety when you're social and that's what allows you to be um to heal um, and since most traumas are socially created, they need to be socially healed. Yeah. yeah. 
right? And, and part of the mythology that comes out of the old idea about the nervous system is that our brain controls everything. Right, you know, brain controls the body. And what polyvagal shows us is that's not, it's the opposite is true. Your body controls your brain. And when you're traumatized, what happens is your body gets in a chronic state of alert where it, it thinks that it's being attacked constantly. So it's a mal, it's, I hate to use technical terms, but it's a maladaptive state, which yeah. means that you're not matching your, your behavior to your situation properly. Now that could be social, right? Meaning, okay, you show up, everyone is in a certain mode right you, you know if you go into a party there's a certain vibe now if you don't synchronize with that vibe you're going to be disruptive right and that's what happens when we're depressed or we have other sort of social anxieties and so on from our past is you go to this event and you you go into a, an emergency state instead of synchronizing and feeling safe and then, of course, that causes problems. And the thing is, it's not conscious. So this is the other myth that needs to be busted, is that you can't change this typically by trying to change your thoughts. Mm -hmm. You have to change it through somatically experienced uh, events and, and so on. And so therefore, if you're going to synchronize with other people, that will turn it on. If you're too overwhelmed by people, you can start with another mammal like a horse or a cat or a dog because they have the same social system we do just not a frontal cortex but they can still synchronize and help us heal and you can't heal if this system is not turned on that's that's one of the most important things to understand if your social system is down you cannot fully heal because you can't go back to your past to remember things and resolve them if you don't feel safe now yeah. And to feel safe now, you have to have a vibrant body and a vibrant sort of social system turned on as well. So, so Michael, before we, before we kind of um, illuminate sort of an example of what a healthy social system looks like and sort of what support may have looked like historically and how that's different from it is today, um, I was wondering if we could take a, just p put a pin in that for a second and talk about what trauma actually is right because i think yes. you know um I it's think another that, surprising thing this right, one. Right. so it, you know with, with people that i talk to i've best been able to simplify it as big t trauma like capital t trauma yeah. and then small t trauma um and so you know as a um anything and this is sort of you know uh hope, i hope i i um I guess issuing a trigger warning at this point that we will be talking about some, you know, in, in some degrees, uh, a certain triggering material, but exactly. as a, you know, anything from somebody that has experienced child abuse or sexual abuse or uh, witnessed like heinous crimes or war, mm -hmm. those are big T traumas. Um, but then those do not, uh, that, that does not, it's not an exclusive group where you have to qualify under one of these sort of like massive no. events to be considered, um, you know, for lack of a better word, trauma, a traumatized individual. That's, a, yeah, that's, I'm glad you're bringing us back to this. This is a really important framing. So let me explain that there, to clarify like big T, big T and little t, there's actually two categories in big T. That now the, the first one is developmental trauma. This happens when your lack of care from your provide, you know, either abuse directly like physical or otherwise or neglect which is another kind of abuse while you're developing as a child sets you up for massive challenges because you miss developmental uh, go, uh, go, what do you call go, goal posts right um that happened to me and um that's the hardest trauma to heal because it's many little traumas over many 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 years typically then there's events like war uh, mugging or rape or something horrible like that, that can be big T, but that's easier to heal because the person may have felt safe before that happened. And, and I'm going to explain what trauma actually is in a second. It has everything to do with safety. And then you have little things like maybe you don't really have much trouble except for elevators, right? That's, and that's much easier to heal because you can actually even think your way through that stuff to some degree. So now let's talk about what trauma actually is. So one of the things that polyvagal corrects is that trauma is not the event. 
Now it's hard to think people, what do you mean? And the reason why it's not the event is because there are many, many people who have gone through horrible experiences and have not got traumatized by them. And th that's shown very distinctly in war. So war is, you know, you, let's say you have a hundred soldiers in battle, same battle, and let's say they all survive. So maybe they're injured or whatever, but, and then you look at them over the next 30 years when they get back home, and a certain percentage will, will have PTSD. And, and the other people don't. So the event didn't cause the trauma. Yeah. What caused the trauma is lack of resources, which is resources to digest the experience in a safe way. Um, and usually the people that show up to those situations actually have a lack of resources when they got to that situation. And this is the part that's hard for people to understand. So the event is not the issue. That's why someone could be traumatized by something that would seem completely benign to everyone else. That's why a lot of traumatized people are shamed into to thinking that they're just exaggerating mm -hmm. or that, that malingering is the technical term for that. Um, and it's used, it's very common for people to be accused of that. So what trauma, so let's think, so it's resources, okay, safety, what does that mean? You need to be safe with other people to feel safe by yourself or in a situation that's challenging. And also, if you don't have the right people to connect with after the event, that also can be a big thing too. So people in your, you know, social resources is a huge piece. But the other piece is the vibrancy of your body because your body has to respond to your environment both in and out. And if it doesn't have the right resources, so imagine you have a virus like COVID, where you're already feeling like you're drowning if you have it too bad. And then on top of it, you have another challenge. Well, you're spent already, like your body can't take out anymore. So then it overloads. So, and so what trauma is, is you're so overloaded that it shoves you way back down into that lizard brain, ancient circuit of shutdown. And if you're down there too long, you, you, the system can't switch back on to safety anymore. You can't find that circuit anymore. And that's what big T is. Because the difference between big T and little t is big T is constant. That's what I had. You never feel safe, no matter what. And maybe for a few minutes here and there are very super controlled situations, but there's no adaptability. You can't roam through your life and expand. You're always trying to protect this little world that you've created. And, and anyone that wants you to do anything different, you freak out. So that's big T, that's PTSD. So that, that's the basic framing of what trauma actually is. And so therefore the way to get well is to, is to build up resources that allow you to, you know, to uh, expand yourself, to be more resilient in the face of you know, life and all its unfairness and challenges, right? Yeah. And, and instead of trying to control your environment, because typically what we want to do when we're traumatized is I want to control everything. You're like the evil Lord who says, everyone gets to do, everyone has to do what I want, otherwise I'm not okay. And that's not what you want. You, what you want is to be adaptable, as, as adaptable as, as humanly possible, because that means that you can do more good in the world. You don't need as much. You don't have to be propped up. Uh, you can actually help other people come up. And, and that's the gift. You get well enough and you become a resource for other people yeah. for their own regulation and their own expansion. And, and I tell you, like, you know, I maybe, I, gosh, I, I just wish I could um, really paint the picture on how frequently you actually see uh, evidence of, of what Michael is trying to explain here on, on a day to day basis in your homes, possibly on television, for sure, uh, politics, for sure. Um, so and it's and it's just varied states of, you know, we had likened it a little bit, Michael, to kind of being on the wrong um, gear shift while you're driving, trying to drive a car. <laughs> totally. Um, and then yeah, I was I was thinking also yesterday, I think the, the best way that you know, I, I could try to explain this is 
Um, for those of you who cook, I admittedly don't really, but I do understand this much is sometimes, you know, you turn the, you, you blast the heat, like you put it on the high and you leave the food and it, you know, it goes straight to like crisp. Um, but then you put it too low and you're sitting there and it's not effective, right? So there's, there's a perfect yep. sort of like middle ground. Um, and it's just time and experience of kind of understanding where that perfect temperature is to cook in a, in a pace that makes it just the best situation, right? Um, yeah, you need the, the, the Goldilocks sort of balance about your, you know, just right. Uh, is, is, that's what adaptability is, right? It's the Goldilocks moment in each moment where you got it just right so that you, you are effective and helpful, right? And, and to yourself and others. But that's the thing is that when when that when we get whacked out by trauma, we become ineffective. Yeah. Right. You. Yeah. You know when you should hug someone, you act like they're dangerous. Yeah. Right. 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 When. Yeah. When, right. That kind of stuff. Yeah, and you know what's also what I also wanted to kind of bring up here that you know blew my mind along the journey. Michael elaborated how he found polyvagal theory earlier. For myself, it was shortly after you know, a series of, of what I wouldn't have considered traumatic uh, events, but, you know, look in hindsight, seeing so, uh, sort of how they all added up together was, um, you know, we had moved to America and then within, you know, spent a beautiful year in New York, um, Kai and I, my teen and I, um, and then uh, shortly after had to move to the Bay Area where, you know, I moved when I was eight months pregnant, gave birth shortly after, didn't have sort of that support system. No. Um, that I had been used to. I was very spoiled in the Philippines. Uh, so much <laughs> has, been, has been sent my way, support in all different forms, right? Like um, from a career where, you know, I was happy and thriving and, and earning money to, you know, having a, a social group, like a friend group and having yep. um, beautiful supporters and, and in all shapes and forms um, and closeness to, to Kaya, who is my eldest. And then all of a sudden moving to California, Kaya was back in New York this sense now where is my left arm practically disoriented uh -huh. completely disoriented then i give birth and i'm in mama bear mode and i'm realizing wow. that my child uh whenever my child is crying i'm feeling a certain way like i have to feed put something in her mouth a pacifier a bottle my breast something to like soothe her and, yeah. and then later realizing that it was I see my inability to regulate my nervous system that was causing me to kind of like rush in and fill XYZ space when my daughter was uh, expressing mm -hmm. this, right? And so what I wanted to kind of like bring back in, in terms of the defining what trauma is, it could be something as simple as, you know, when you were a baby, um, you being a given a pacifier every time you're trying to express emotion. Um, and, then, and then learning to, to just not express that emotion anymore or the, you know, I, I understand what it is to be a mother and the resources that we have and the support, you know, the, the village has changed significantly. And so there's, there's no judgment. There's no wrong. There's no wrong. Right. No, whatever you had to do to make it like that's what your, your nervous system was able to handle uh, at the time. But I think having children in that, especially in that stage, is an invitation to, to, to notice and get curious about the resistance, right? Or curious about the trigger. Um, because that has, you know, personally just opened up so many doors for me in understanding I see. And then polyvagal theory now helping me understand the science behind it so that I have full autonomy and control over how I respond to every given situation, even if it is as simple as holding a moment before I go into my um, stuffing my face with peanut butter or like whatever, <laughs> whatever coping sort of mechanism that, you know, I've developed. Yeah, right? even that pint of ice cream, right? I mean, it's, cookies I mean, that, and, that's exactly, cream. <laughs> you know, um, the thing that polyvagal theory does, I mean, it, once you learn it really well, that, um, Deb Dana, who's one of the experts on polyvagal application and therapy, she said it so well. She goes, once you understand this fully, once you really get it, you'll never see humanity the same way again. Yeah. It's, it's a real tool for forgiveness, yes. especially to oneself. So here's one of the things that it says that's so profound. Most of our decisions are made for us by our subconscious. Uh, and even when they're correct, okay, so, and so therefore, whatever you did or didn't do when you were attacked or abused 
um, that you're ashamed of. I can't believe I put up with that, or I can't believe I didn't leave. Like, let's say if you're an abuse, abusive partner, it's uh, you, it's not really you, um, so to speak. It's your it's that lizard brain I mentioned. And here's the other thing: is that it's usually correct. So if you're alive, it worked. Yeah. Because its goal is to keep you alive. That's its. It's like its. Uh, it's what do they call it? Mission. Mm -hmm. um, it's orders from from mission command is keep this person alive. That's the goal, right? And so, whatever adaptive response you went into to survive, and whether whatever ones you're using right now, you need to give yourself a break, because even uh, the polyvagal view of addiction is mind blowing. Yeah. Because what he explains, uh, Dr. Porges, is that addiction is your best possible bet at regulating your stress at that moment, mm -hmm. given what you have to work with. Yeah. And, the, and the minute that you have enough other resources, you will get, they'll drop that drug without even thinking about it. Yeah. So these people are not, you know, morally corrupt, lazy, weak, no. And you don't need to see yourself that way. And by the way, it doesn't have to be cocaine. It could be sugar or I don't know, whatever you're into, pizza. Um, binge watching uh, some show. That's how we're trying to survive, right? And and now here's the other thing that I want to just put forward real quick. The goal is to change the default in 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 this that system. And and this is a little heady, and I'm sorry about that. But the default is what runs your life. Yeah. And you can change it because through personal practice and the right kind of interaction with other people, you can. You can set it to a more adaptive state, and then you will actually start being successful without even trying as hard as you used to, okay. because your responses yeah. to your world are so much better than they used to be. I hope I did. Does that make sense? It absolutely yeah. does make sense, Michael. And I, I want to take this opportunity now to, to take what you said and then kind of um, translate it into because we're talking about all these ways that it, it, it has blown our minds and it has, you know, just been uh, uh, life changing, <laughs> like period. Um, what, how, what is poly, like, what are the tools? Like, how did we, you know, how, how did you um, get that uh, ability or that skill to, to, to get the temperature right or to, you know, increase your to return the system, you mean like return your system yeah. sense of safety. Yeah, so Here's what is so important to understand about this is that um, it's a re kind of a reframing of your priorities in one sense. So the first thing is that you have to understand that successful bonding with other people is your number one priority. So you need to throw this thing out that says, I need to be fine on my own. That's complete garbage. That is some sort of hyper intellectual thing that came from Descartes or someone like that. No, you don't. You need to find your safety with other people so that then you can be okay on your own. It's the, it's the total opposite. Um, and, the, and you do that as much as you can. Like you, you find what you want is you have to ask yourself, okay, do I have anyone in my life I can go to if I'm feeling really overwhelmed? That would actually want what's best for me, right? Now that, now that doesn't mean that you always just want to go to them when you're overwhelmed, but I'm just saying you have that sort of resource. So you need to have friends and a partner, ideally, hopefully more than that, but let's just start on the basics, that have your best interest, interest at heart. And you want to nurture those relationships as much as you can, because those, that's, your, that's your safety net, more than even money. Like, you know, you, you need people that really love you and care about you. And then the second thing is that you need to practice in ways that exercise the neural pathways and the different nervous system areas that are associated with the social system. And that there's a lot of things you can do, but one of the simple the kind of simple ones is breathing practice. So pranayama, Wim Hof method, whatever you want to do. Uh, different kinds of yoga practices often include breathing. Um, and you want to do it every day. Because what you're doing is you're doing the personal practice to make the social connection easy, more, more possible, yeah. right? And, the, and but the, each one affects the other, right, uh, in a positive way. And then also you've got to ask yourself, how am I taking care of myself? 
am I treating myself like my, so you think, ask yourself this question, do I treat myself like my best friend would? If I'm planning my day and I'm, you know, if I ask my best friend, how does this look, this schedule? And they say, are you nuts? You know, there's no time for you in there. Okay, and then you need to, to redo it, right? You have to say, I deserve to, to sleep. I deserve to have three meals a day. I deserve to have exercise. Why? Because all of those changes your physiology for the better, right? Uh, and if you do them every day, then your physiology becomes optimized to be a very successful social, social bonder, right? And you know, if you're sick, it affects your, your psychology. So, so Porges explains that psychology comes from biology, not the other way around. Not the other way around, yeah. Yeah. Right, and therefore physical and mental illness, there's no difference. They're one and the same, y'all. Absolutely. Physical and it's mental just... illness are one and the same thing, one period. Same. Yeah. So if you think you're gonna be healthy socially or healthy mentally, but you eat donuts for breakfast and go to bed late and, and, and you, know, you don't take time off because you don't think you deserve it, that's not gonna support your healing. And you know, that, that what you really want is to say to yourself, I want to be my best self. I want to show up in the world to contribute the best way I can, even if it's limited right now. Let's say you're recovering from some serious trauma. And what would it take? What sort of support do I need to give myself? Do I need to insist on with other people? I maybe have to be aggressive, assertive yeah. about it. Go That's ahead, right. be assertive. Sure. Say no. Yeah. You know, I think say, right, insist, yes, I need time off. I need one day, just the two of us, maybe your partner, right? and you put your foot down and and by the way all of this takes time and patience as well it's not an overnight thing people get all frustrated because well, i did this thing for two weeks and it didn't work and I, how about try six months how try you know at least eight weeks before you decide something doesn't work and and the truth is, is don't give up that self-care the fundamentals of taking care of yourself are one of the most loving things you can do for yourself and, and Michael, that is largely important because, uh, especially through the pandemic and, and largely just because of uh, progression, the, the family unit, the village, that social sort of support system is yeah. definitely not what it looked like um, no. some decades ago. Yeah. Especially, I think it's a little better in the Philippines than it is here. Yeah. Um, we, we're ahead of you in, this, in, in removing all the natural support that we used to have <laughs> uh, built into our society um to say the least and that's actually i want to frame something else real quick one of the challenges that we all have right now is this rapidly changing world that we're in it is a serious challenge to our nervous system and here's why in the past there was all kinds of things built into your daily life that you didn't do that helped regulate your stress in the ways that we're talking about so in the ancient world, you know, in the days before electricity, everyone went to bed when it got dark. Yeah. There was no such thing as sleep deprivation. You had, not, you had automatic sort of community, partly because you needed people to survive, right? Even if it's a village, but even before that, a tribe, every single member of the tribe was incredibly valuable because there's only like 30 of you or 100 of you, but whatever it was, it wasn't very many. And so you had built in community, right? And then you also had exercise built in because you had to do that su to survive. And then there, and then what else? Oh, food is like big one. Food's like there, straight no, from the ground. No, what's that? Food is straight from the ground or like- Oh, right, I, all the food was organic, yeah. right? You didn't have to choose in the supermarket, which one of this is healthy. And um, what was the other thing I was thinking? Um, so we had, it slipped me, but anyway, so you had all these things built in. So here's the problem. In the modern world, you have to store, it oh, I know the other, there was no news except verbal. And so here's a, here's a real thing. I wrote an article about this, it's on my website. The ancient world, people encount encountered risks that were considered life-threatening only now and then. We encounter messages from social media that are life-threatening, at least that's how it's perceived by our subconscious. How many times a day? Yeah. I mean, it depends how often you're on it. It could be a hundred times a day. So you basically faced a hundred tigers today. 
and you wonder why you're more stressed out than your ancestors. I mean, it's no, duh. It's like, and your subconscious doesn't care if it's on the phone. It still thinks that tiger's around the corner somewhere. Yep. And so all these things stacked on top of constant change, right? So the way that we define safety is predictability. That's what it means. And if the world is changing every second, uh, then th there's no predictability. And, and even social change, which you know, I'm not arguing against social change because it, it needs to happen. Um, you know, for, for the last, I don't know, uh, 100 million years, uh, men and women had certain roles. And then in the 60s, this birth control thing came along and completely changed everything. And then women could work and so on. And if you think that we have that figured out yet, <laughs> uh, we don't. It's, it's complicated and it's different and there's nothing to lean on. Like you can't go to your grandma and say, how did you handle being an independent woman who had her own job and raised two kids? She doesn't know, not in the modern sense. I mean, she can give you advice otherwise, but she doesn't know how to navigate the modern world with you know, Facebook and, and who knows what else. So that this is the challenge and, and what it demands of most people is to have more willpower than they actually have. Mm -hmm. and so that's just something we have to sort out. But the main thing is to, to, you know, you have to focus your priorities. And imagine if you're, if you're spending time connecting with people in a bonding way, you'll have a lot less time for Twitter. Thank God. Yeah. You know, so, <laughs> right. Yeah. I, I do also want to take a, a moment to, to speak to, Gosh, what do you call it? Martyrdom, martyrdom, and martyrdom, like, yeah, yeah, and sort of um, a sort of like self-sacrificial role that a lot of women uh, take, um, or fe you know the the, pe the people that play that role uh, within the family system, um, yeah, and you know down to down to the littlest things of I'm completely parched. I can't remember the last time I had a drink of water or exactly. fed myself. Like I've reheated my coffee four times in the microwave. Um, I don't know if that's anybody else's problem. <laughs> Maybe it's just me. But well, I bet it is. <laughs> uh, but just sort of that, you know, that bandwidth really significantly shrinking when you're when you're depriving yourself. Y'all, you know, like I'm telling you, there's so many times where I thought I was training myself. I've, I used to fly by myself a lot as a child and uh, would always get the window seat and would challenge myself to see how long I could hold my pee before having to go, not knowing <laughs> that little things like that were shutting down my ability for my body to tell me what it needed in any given yeah. moment, which then I'm not saying that holding my pee led to me being in a situation where, you know, uh, I, I, I was raped or, or anything like that. Well, I don't know. Who yeah, knows? No, that's, that's, yeah. that's a really good point. I mean, um, I mean, I'm not an expert on some of these things, but I can say to you that women were designed, it seems genetically to be more self-sacrificing as a way, as a functional way to make sure children survived, right? And so, like so many things that even Polyvagal points out to us, we, we did look at how we're wired genetically through time and see which of those have to be modified, right? The other thing is that women tend to be more agreeable. Ten, they tend to. I'm not saying that. Shout out to my people that, pleasers in the building. Right? Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> yeah right? so, and that's actually a genetic trait, by the way. So, so agreeableness is a genetic trait. And it's very functional. I mean, if you're, you're a caretaker, but if it's too much, then you tend to become resentful because you're not getting your needs met. You're not even good at knowing what they are. Right. So you're, you're kind of stuck in the cycle of you know, I feel good when I, I agree and I adjust to others. And I don't feel so good when I say no. Mm -hmm. The problem is, is that you do need to say no more often or make some sort of, you know, con what do you call it? Negotiation instead of just saying yes. And sometimes you just have to say, you know what? I don't want to do that anymore. I don't really feel like adjusting anymore. And the thing that's kind of interesting is that women, when they go through menopause, often the hormone shift causes them to be less agreeable. And that's when they tell their husband, I'm not doing dishes anymore. I don't want to cook. You do it yourself. And he's like, what happened? You know, you know, and I'm going to have a career now. See you later. You know, she'll, you know, yes. you know she'll be around a little bit. Um, but you know, our tendencies uh, have double-edged swords to them. And especially 
it's my understanding that in the Philippines, you have this sort of expansion where women are learning how to be more independent um, and more um, assertive and all that, but the culture doesn't really support it, right? So, so here we have this sort of battle where you, you have to build up your resilience. Now, this is the other reason why you do personal practice and more code regulation, so that you can face those things that feel dangerous mm -hmm. or unsafe and maintain your position, right? So how do you do that? Well, you have to have some structure under you. You don't just go half cocked off there. You need to feel like you're not going to be thrown into the, you know, into the garbage, so to speak, if you stand up for yourself. And you have to have resources. Again, it's about resources, both internal and external. And then you'll have the, you know, you'll have more bandwidth to, to face those difficult sort of soul stretching activities and actions that we all tend to run away from because they're hard to do. They're hard to you know? do. Yeah. And, and, and that's the thing, right? Because it sounds like, you know, if you were to form this into a list, right? It's like, okay, so you have to make sure you're sleeping properly and you're doing your breath and you're, you're eating, eating. properly. You've got a supportive, a supportive a social system, friends or partner. Um, you've got sort of an upward mobility, like a path to upward mobility, be that a, a job that is like, yeah. you know. You, you have to ask yourself, do you have enough education for your job, right? that sort of thing. Yeah, yeah. It's not just enough to have a good job. Are you effective? Is it meaningful? That's the other thing. Is it a meaningful job? Does it give you purpose? Right? And so I mean, all of those things sound like a nice and quick and easy list to just like spit off. But when you really boil down each one of those things is is years of, of uh, you know, kind of uh, unprogramming, yeah. deprogramming and relearning, unlearning and relearning. I guess you could say. Yeah, I would actually call it adaptive training. This is okay. what I like to call it. Okay. Because see, let me give you another frame that helps with this. Whatever you, what, what, I'm sorry, whatever your subconscious chose to help you survive when you were in a difficult situation, uh, it often doesn't reset. So what you're doing is you're, you're, you now are maladaptive. So in other words, you, you came from a dangerous jungle. Think of it this way. It was full of tigers and lions and stinging insects. And then you come to a, a safe jungle or forest. You don't want to act the same way you did in this new forest that you did in the old one because it's not the same environment. So what we're learning to do is to, to realize that the way in which we adapted before doesn't serve us anymore. And we need to retune the system to a new environment. And, a new, and the, the new environment for women in, a, in Asian countries is to feel safe, to stand up and, you know, speak your mind, live your life more the way you want instead of what everyone else wants from you. Um, you know, be, be savvy with money, right? Be savvy with running a business yeah. and not thinking you have to marry a rich man to be okay. That kind of old, that's kind of an old model, right? And, but to do that, you have to have a change of, uh, of adaptive response to your environment. Because if, if the old model was true, okay, the goal is to marry a man that has good, you know, earning skills. That's a different strategy than the new one, isn't it? The way that you respond to people, the way in which you feel safe in doing this or that, how much energy you put into this or that totally shifts. Yeah. It's a new era, right? It's a new paradigm completely, but it's really about being adaptive and expanding yourself to uh, what you want to do is, okay, what's the environment I'm in? What's my goals? What's in my way? Yeah. Right. What part of my patterning of response is in my way? And then the next question is what practices can I embrace? And what, what people can I hang out with that's going to support that goal in a loving way, right? In a safe and loving way. And that's why you don't want to make friends with the people that say, you know, it's, let's say your goal is to be an entrepreneur. Uh, why don't you just get married and have kids mm. and, and forget about all the stressful stuff? That's not your friend. That's, that's someone you don't want to, you want someone that says, okay, you want this, I want it for you too. And we're going to support each other in having what we want. Yeah.
yeah. without judgment, right? Without trying to pull you down and put you in a category you don't belong in anymore. Yeah. So that kind of thing. And also you, you say no judgment, Michael. I also do want to um, to kind of bring it back to a different perspective. So if you're, if you're somebody uh, that is witnessing somebody uh, in your life potentially um, in a dysregulated state, somebody that goes say into freeze and is unable to um, communicate, respond or participate. Mm -hmm. um, there's this sense of uh, like, how, how would you treat somebody in your life that way to help them kind of come back into regulation? Like, is there anything <laughs> that you could do for loved ones? Absolutely. Um, that's a, such a great question. So, so let, let me just start with the first best gift you can give anyone you love is to be as self-regulated as you possibly can be. So that's the first step now. And the reason for that is because it's the more self-regulated you are, the more self-regulated everyone else is around you because you, cause that's, cause we're networked, right? Like family dysfunction is never one person. It's the, it's the dynamic. It's the, so that's, that's the base. Okay. So now, um, the next thing is, um, that if you understand what the different survival strategies mean in terms of what the person is in. So what kind of critter are they, right? Cause we do, and when we're in the different survival circuits, we are a different critter altogether. Yeah. The way we see the world is completely altered, right? So if you understand that if someone's in shutdown, which is the lizard brain, they don't understand language. They don't uh, have any energy because their system's trying to survive by playing dead basically. And touch, talking doesn't work touch works usually right now they may be so defensive they don't want to be touched but typically if someone gets if they're really depressed if they're really shut down they need to be hugged they need to be held now if they're in sympathetic that's they're going to be aggressive or very avoidance right so in that case words still don't work very well they work a little better and again it has to do with more of a of a, of a somatic sort of approach unless you can bring them down you know you can help bring them down so um the way so so here's it, it's a very complicated question actually because there's a lot of different things but the thing i want to put forward is if you're not regulated you can't help them yeah so that this is why being regulated is the number one goal um because any of you can understand this you get into an argument with a loved one and if both people are just off the rails upset, nothing you're gonna say or do is gonna make a difference. So what someone has to do there is make a move towards regulation, which usually means taking a break, by the way. You say, okay, uh, we've been screaming at each other for 45 minutes, I'm gonna go for a walk. Yeah. And that, that break, that distance gives people a chance to downregulate and to kind of get out of that, um, uh, what do you call it, that, the, the limbic, the, the, the fight flight stage, or maybe they're shut down. And there's a better chance that you can, can actually make a connection. Yeah. And, you know, the other thing is, um, you also recognize that uh, to feel safe, people need to be connected with, right? And, um, and there's a, here's the other thing that I have to tell you is, you, you can't fool other people's nervous systems. Yeah. And if you understand polyvagal and you really practice understanding where you are and where other people are, and the signs are very clear when you're in different states of survival, or like if you're in the safety state, your voice changes, yep. your body language changes, your eye movements are different, your whole uh, kind of kind of rhythmical sort of connection style, if you have it at all, is completely different. So there's a lot of ways to become literate in this. And then also, like you said, to understand what the best possible sort of um, approach might be. Yeah. But even just knowing it helps. And you also don't make them wrong for being the way they are, because if they're non-responsive, right? But they're in the shutdown, well, of course they are, because yeah. that's exactly what happens when you're in that place, yeah. right? Yeah, and, and also I just, you know, we, we have five minutes left on this call, but I also really did just want to um, include that. And I think Michael alluded to this much earlier in the talk, but no one series of, of 
things works the same for every person. No. Like it's this weird, like everybody no. has their own custom treasure map. And I, we can, yeah. we can kind of tell you what's worked uh, a gamut of things that have worked, what order they will work in for your life, maybe completely make it look completely different from the person next to you. Yeah. Um, chances are though, I, I tell me um, if, if I'm off, here but if you were raised in similar situations so like you and siblings might have some commonalities in terms of certain stress responses or trauma responses mm -hmm. because you were raised in a xyz environment yeah. together it's, right um but, but yeah so like what could what work for one person might not work for the other an example of that is uh you could say breath work for one person works for myself i know that i couldn't like actually understand how breath worked like i would be at yoga and be like you know connected to the breath and in and out and my my breathing wasn't moving that way it would actually move me into a state of like you know almost like trying to catch up the breath to the to what what i thought it was supposed to be <laughs> um but what i found was a uh, movement yeah like self-touch mm -hmm. and you know mm -hmm. just in whatever form that that speaks to you in um self-touch and and kind of like orienting, always understanding where yeah. I am, coming, bringing a sense. I was doing, uh, uh, um, Dr. Levine does the VU, where you go VU, and it kind of vibrates through the body and kind of wakes up little parts of you. That was my entry point, honestly, was that. And then it started becoming um, sporadic dance and movement, just like moving your body whenever you feel the call to. And then everything opened up after that. So you're I'm glad entry, you brought that yeah. up. Oh, sorry, go ahead. Didn't mean to interrupt yeah, you. so the entry point may look completely different for for everyone. Yeah. Yeah, that what I encourage people to do is first of all, just commit to self care. And and, and and the first step is say, okay, some sort of practice. Five minutes a day. I mean, just start simple. And what you want to do is you take kind of the known list. And I think do we have a link for for the guide that I that the jelly put together. The team will yeah. will will uh, uh, send that out to the to the tribe. Yeah. And to the okay. Good. So yeah, we have this. I have the self um, care guide that allows you to. It shows you how to find states of safety both on your own and with people. And what you want to do is okay, take something from the list that th you think you might want to try. Try it, but be dedicated. And then you observe. How does this feel? How does, is this helping? And if it doesn't go into the next one, because you are a different person than other people, you have different sort of built in and also experientially wired orientations. And then you find something that works, use it. And then, um, and just keep going. And sometimes you'll modify it. Sometimes you'll add something else. Cause I started out with certain breath practice and uh, I didn't like it. And then, I, you know, another one I liked, but it was 45 minutes. And then, you know, and then I tried Wim Hof and it really worked. And I'm like, okay, that's what I'm doing now. So it's not a right answer. And, and so Wim Hof, just really quickly, Wim Hof is the cold plunge, right? The uh, yeah, plunge. he's the one that does cold exposure and also a very specific kind of breath uh, rhythm um, that it, it actually basically um, acclimates you to low oxygen, high and low oxygen states. Okay. Uh, blah, blah, blah. But anyway, that's a whole different subject. But yes, that's the Wim Hof uh, is the cold exposure guy, the ice man, as he likes to call himself. So yeah, you want to, you want to start, you want to take a pr first, you commit to taking care of yourself. Second, you start in being the Edison where you say, okay, let, let's find out what works and what doesn't work and be creative about it, be open minded. And then, and don't let anyone else tell you what they, you should do because that's that's garbage. You you need to know your own inner map to safety. This is what you want to do. Is you're trying to find your own dynamic. Who am I? How am I actually wired? And how would I bring myself to a better place to be a, the better part of my? You know, I can bring forth the better part of myself. That's unique. And it takes a lot of effort, focus and dedication to figure it out and to apply these things. But when you do, then you start showing up in the world that makes it a lot better for everyone else. Right. You know, again, it's a self regulatory thing. You have to be you have to know yourself to be able to self regulate. You have to know when I'm upset. Here's what I need. Yeah. Yeah. You know, that sort of thing. Or, or even when what makes me happy? What gives me purpose? Yeah. For sure. What am I good at? Right. You know, what can I share? How can I enrich the world? Yeah.
Um, and you want to support that stuff. And of course, hang out with people that want you to be like that too. Okay. Right. So there's, there's, the, there's the, there's the frame right there. Thank you, Michael. We have hit the hour mark. I think it needs to be an Please. hour for us to save it on Instagram. I hope to have another opportunity to talk for you, uh, to you, oh. um, all the links that we have mentioned today, all the resources, uh, some of the team have put them in the comments, reach out to us if you want another resource and we will send it your way. Michael, yep. thank you so thank much you. till the next time. Yeah. Yes, no, thank you so much. This was a great fun. Okay, everybody follow Michael for more too. Thank you so much. This is, this is terrific. And uh, thanks everyone for coming. Big love. Bye. Ciao.